this invitation to participate in, in the conference about global citizenship education. Um, I was asked to put the questions of the day in, in the broader context of the Transforming Education Summit, and that's what, what I'll try to do. Let me start by, by saying that we are failing at one of our most important tasks. Almost any person would agree that in today's world, a good quality education is essential. We know that a person who cannot read and understand a simple text, a person without basic numeracy skills, without a clear understanding of the relation between cause and effect, or without elementary social and civic skills, is a person lacking the capacities for leading a meaningful life in today's world and the capacity for citizenship. And yet, as of today, the combination of long-standing poverty, increasing inequality, misguided policies, the impact of the, of the pandemic, are leaving a vast majority of children and, and young persons in the less developed countries with so little education that only three out of 10 would be able to read and understand a simple text by age 10. This means that seven out of every 10 persons in less developed countries, but also in many regions and neighborhoods in, in, in rich countries, are being left out. Out and yet in. Out from the opportunities, yet too close to the malls and the shops whose windows and websites showcase the wildest array of goods that are in supply for anybody who is anybody to enjoy, for, but, but not for them. Wealth and consumption, conspicuous consumption, have never been higher in human history. I mean, a few examples. Whiskey caskets are being aged in the space station. Coldplay entertains a rich guy's daughter's wedding, and other three rich guys take their friends for a tour in space. But at the same time, left out of education, two-thirds of humanity will struggle just to survive in low-paid jobs if they get a job at all. We know these things, and we also know how to fix them. It takes a teacher, it takes a school, it takes some learning resources from books and notebooks to a tablet or a PC and an internet access. We could add school meals and a few other basic conveniences to facilitate learning, not much to ask, just the right to learn. And we should ask ourselves, what, what should this right to learn imply? What should every person be able to, to learn? According to the vision statement from the Transforming Education Summit, we said there are four key dimensions to learning based on the, on the, the lower report. First, they must be able to learn to learn. This starts with their ability to, of course, read and write, to identify, understand, communicate clearly and effectively, to develop numerous digital scientific knowledge and skills. Education must also instill in them the curiosity, the creativity, the capacity for critical thinking, and to nurture social and emotional skills, empathy, and, and kindness. Second, they must be able to learn to do. As, as life itself and the world of work undergo rapid and fundamental changes, so must education change to prepare every person for the challenges of the future, including the green, the digital, and the care economy, and offering them lifelong learning opportunities, both in terms of formal and informal education. Third, and this, this is a bigger challenge for educational systems, they must be able to learn to live together, and this has a lot to do with citizenship and global citizenship. In a world of increasing inequality, rising tensions, fraying trust, weakened democratic culture, increased displacement, and a dramatic environmental crisis, education must help us to live better with each other and with nature. This has to do with ethics, with equality and justice, with civic responsibility, democracy, and human rights. It has to do with the respect understanding, and especially with the enjoyment of our rich human diversity. And of course, it has to do with our capacity and active commitment as, as citizens and as global citizens. A particular importance here, of course, is the unabashed respect for human rights and the pursuit of gender equality. This requires a gender-sensitive curriculum that promotes uh, sex and affective education, addresses gender-based prejudice, norms, stereotypes, empowers and equips learners to combat violence against women and sexually diverse persons and ensure adequate sexual and reproductive health for all. But at the same, the same is true with respect of human diversity in general, in particularly with respect to migrants, displaced people, and even with indigenous populations. Finally, and this is something educational systems very often 
forget or, or underestimate, uh, they must be able to learn to be. The, the deepest purpose of education lies precisely in learning how to live well instilling in learners the values and the capacities to lead a meaningful life, to enjoy that life, to live it fully. Education must expand every learner's potential for creativity and innovation, their capacity to enjoy and to express themselves through the arts, their awareness of history, the diversity of cultures, and their disposition for leading a healthy life to practice physical activities, games, entertainment, sports. Summing up, education implies every person's right to be an active, productive, and significant member of society. Their right, and of course their responsibility to contribute to society, to be active citizens, to be productive and creative workers, to be good friends and relatives, to be able to lead a fulfilling life and to enjoy it. That is what education is supposed to produce, people capable of living together well. To meet this higher purpose of education, it was argued at the summit that we need to connect the dots by looking specifically at our educational systems at the national and at the local level, I mean from the ministries to the classrooms, and to transform at least three of their essential elements. First, schools themselves. Education does not happen in a vacuum. If we want to solve the crisis of equity we face in education, we must transform schools into safe, healthy, inclusive, and stimulating learning places. And the school is not a prison where we uh, train students. The school understood as the time and space of learning must transcend the old, closed, and static idea uh, of school. The schools of the future, whether formal or informal, physical or virtual, probably hybrid, must not exclude anybody. They should accept every person, make them feel welcome, cared for, protected, stimulated, and supported in their, in their learning needs according to each one's capacities and through their whole life. Second, of course, teachers. To transform education, we must support teachers so that they can also transform themselves into agents of change. It, it, it is very frequently that teachers really don't, don't get the support to become uh, facilitators and guides in the comprehension of complex realities. They must be trained and empowered to transcend from, from passive to active, from vertical and unidirectional to collaborative. Uh, they must pro promote learning based on experience, inquiry, curiosity, and develop the, the capacity, the joy, and of course the discipline for, for problem solving. They should also guide their students in their learning to care for each other, to confront and solve conflicts peacefully and to respect and enjoy each other in, in their diversity. And third, we have the digital revolution. Uh, everybody's now talking, especially with the artificial intelligence and chat GPT and all these things, but this is a, a, a not a linear question. If, if harnessed properly, the digital revolution could be one of the most powerful tools for ensuring quality education for all, and transforming the way teachers teach and learners learn. But if it is not harnessed properly, as we have seen in many of our countries during the pandemic and in the current debate about artificial intelligence, it could rather exacerbate inequalities and divide us into increasingly intolerant bubbles. The problem here is that digital resources are typical public goods. While they require a significant effort and a high fixed cost to be produced, once they are produced, they can be widely used by an increasing amount of teachers and learners everywhere with very little or no additional cost. If left to the market, such resources would become artificially scarce and quite expensive. That is why we must effectively transform digital teaching and learning resources into global pu public goods so that their financing, their design, their production, and especially their distribution is organized so as to guarantee free and open access of teachers and learners all over the world, allowing digital learning resources to effectively foster the sharing of human knowledge from an intercultural perspective. By now you could probably be asking yourselves, how much would that cost? Uh, transforming the schools, transforming the teachers, having the digital revolution uh, properly harnessed. And, and yes, to transform education both in terms of access 
And in terms of quality and relevance, we certainly need to invest more, to invest more equ equitably, and to invest more efficiently in education. And yet, as I said, we are failing badly as two out of every three potential learners are being left out of, of the right to education. How can we look these young people in the eye and tell them bluntly that either by action or in action, we will deny them that right? We could say that there are many of them, and, and we would be right. There, there are over one billion children. Uh, and they need good teachers. About 70 million new teachers are needed. Uh, we need training for over 85 million teachers who are working today. And they also need good infrastructure in their schools with internet connectivity, learning resources, virtual, and so on. These numbers could sound too big to tackle. Uh, we don't have the money to pay for that, we could say. Or the finance minister could tell us there is no fiscal space. And Yet, we would be wrong. When you look at the numbers, today we invest roughly $5 trillion in education in the world. That's about 6% of global GDP. But even though most children live in low and lower middle income countries, most of our educational investment is concentrated in high income countries. High income countries account for 63% of global investment in education. That's about two thirds of, of global investment in education. But they attend only 10% of the school age population of the world. The situation is very different when you talk about lower middle income countries. They ha have 8% of global investment in education with which they must educate 50%, half the world's school age population. And, and it's even worse when you think about low income countries. They try to educate 25% of the world's school age population with only 0.6% of global investment in, in education. This terribly unequal distribution of educational investment translates, of course, into a global reproduction of educational inequality as the amount of resources each country can invest per school age person is terribly different. Roughly, Per capita spending in education is over $8,000 a year in high-income countries. It's about $1,000 per year in upper-middle-income countries. But it is only $300 per year in lower-middle-income countries and merely $50 per year in low-income countries. That is $1 per week per school-age person. You don't have to be an expert to understand what this means. In low and lower middle income countries, the challenge of educational investment can only be solved if the national effort is substantially complemented by international cooperation. For countries that are investing from $50 to $300 a year per person, even doubling their national effort, which they should, would not be enough. The international community must step in and make the difference. In most countries, however, this investment should be financed with national resources because it makes sense to do so. Investing in education should be seen not only as a moral or political imperative, which it is, but it should also be understood as a sensible and efficient economic investment. Imagine that it's been 50 years since the publication of Sakharopoulos' seminal book, uh, Returns to Education and International Comparison. In, in that book, Sakharopoulos demonstrated rigorously what we already knew, both from intuition and from experience. In simple economic terms, education pays. After that, we've had five decades of research that have confirmed this time and again. Investing in education is one of the best, if not the best, investment a country can make to improve the material well-being of its population is reflected both by its income and by many other indicators of, of the quality of life. So, yes, the figures that would be needed uh, to invest in, in education for everyone in the world to have access to, to a decent education are large, but they are not that large as to grant the assumption that we can't do something about. Yes, we could if we really wanted to, which leads us to the final section of, of my presentation. If we know that education pays, 
why is it then that countries do not invest more in education? Why is it that they do not invest a higher proportion of their GDP and their national budget? Why don't they increase their investment per student and per school age person? Why is there such a strong opposition for progressive revamping of tax systems that could increase the tax to GDP ratio and open more fiscal space for the financing of education? Those are critical questions. To answer this, these questions, uh, which are, by the way, typical questions for a good citizen, why is it that we don't pay more taxes to finance education? Uh, we need to understand that there is a very strong relation between the kind of development a country has and the kind of education that comes with it. And it, it, this is a relation that goes both ways. Putting it in very simple terms, when a country is highly unequal and has a large supply of very cheap labor, it can find itself in a low-level equilibrium, or let's put it in, in a poverty trap. The type of investments most easily attracted by the abundance of cheap labor are typically unsophisticated investments with low capital intensity, low productivity, little need for human capital, but still they can be very profitable, not because they contribute with increasing productivity, but because of their continued access to low-cost human and natural resources. With no need for an increasingly qualified labor force, there is little incentive in such an economy for raising taxes to finance education, which is perceived as a mere expenditure. The situation can be even more complicated, and, and this is very typical, when countries get entangled into the typical race to the bottom strategy, where they deregulate the market, the labor market, uh, the exploitation of natural resources, their, they devalue their currencies, they grant generous tax exemptions to further reduce costs and attract foreign investments. As, as many different authors like, authors like, like Asimoglu and Robinson have argued, in countries where this extractive or low productivity economy prevails, the institutional framework tends to be weak and the balance of economic and political power is significantly skewed towards the upper echelons of income and wealth, which again tend to oppose the kind of progressive tax increases that would be necessary to finance universal quality education. Education is the only way out of a poverty trap, but poverty traps curtail the capacity to invest in education, even though such an investment makes both social and economic sense in the long term. Short-term profits and short-sighted political gain will not allow it. It will take vision, and more than that, it will take a movement capable of altering the balance of power for a country to break free from these poverty traps and embark on a virtuous cycle of sustainable development, increasing wages, increasing productivity, expanding and improving education, making sustainable use of natural resources, and strengthening political institutions and, of course, citizenship. This is all about global citizenship. If we are not able to guarantee the right to education of every person, if we are not able to break free from the poverty traps and the ever increasing dynamics of inequality, we would not be acting as true global citizens, and we would be curtailing the possibility for each and every one of those potential learners to become citizens, both national and global citizens themselves. That is the challenge we, we face in terms of education, of transforming education, and I think also in terms of, of really global citizenship. Thank you. <laughs>